Whatever it is that you're trying to do, what, however you deem success, are you tough enough to do that every single day? And so if you remove talent, then it becomes consistency, then it becomes discipline, then it becomes how are you spending your time and are you tough enough to do those things every day? So I said to my guy, hey, uh, why haven't I got uh, Ryan's book? Can you look up when you order? Yeah. Coach, I ordered it on this day. This is the text message you sent. I ordered yeah. it that day. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't have it yet. Interesting. No, they, it didn't come out till the 11th. Like, it wasn't released till the 11th. So I wonder if it shipped late uh, or what. Weird. I did not get it on the 11th. Uh, I got it. I can tell you when I got it. I got it on uh, Friday two weeks ago because I left on Tuesday with my family. Yeah. And I took the book on vacation. Oh. Uh -huh. But, you know, I read a, I read four books at a time, and I read complete one of those books per week. So okay. I've read one book a week for yeah. years. Yeah. But I kind of have a system of how I'm reading those books. But you trump the system. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, so I get the book. I put it in my rotation of four. So my wife knows how much I think of you, and she knew I was coming here today. And so last night, uh, we put our dog of 17 years down yesterday morning. Oh, God. I had to do that last year. It's the worst. Yeah, so uh, we have four kids, 22 to 15. It just so happened that all four kids are at home because last week we went on vacation. Yeah. So the emotion in the house was a little... Yeah. unique last night so long story late last night she goes you're going to see your friend tomorrow and i go i'm really excited about seeing him to be honest and she goes did you read that book <laughs> and i go no she goes why i said sweetie i was with you last week i didn't say no to anything you guys asked me to do yeah so i didn't get my normal reading in on vacation sure so I haven't got. Well, we're, we're we're going to talk about me, uh, you, not me. So, but I I remember because I was just I was describing as we were starting like my we sort of designed our life to like minimize time in the car, everything central, everything simple, and then my son started at this new school, which is like blown. It's very important that he goes there, yes. but it's sort of blown our lives apart. But I remember I visited you when you were that you were at Virginia Tech then, and you were like, I told the real estate agent when we were looking for a house that it had to be less than 11 minutes from yes. the facility. And you were like, and I drive slow. Yes. And I thought that's so smart because people, you want to get the nicest house for the best price, but you're not thinking about the, the inefficiencies or Correct. the cost of your whole day, week, life pivoting yes. around this inconvenience you've built into your existence. Everybody, uh, so where you and I took the picture? I lived eight minutes from there. Yeah. But whoever you met that day that was employed at Virginia Tech, they lived in the valley. Gorgeous. Yeah. The country club. Not what you and I think a country club. Yeah. That version of country club. And the lady, the real estate agent, I'm like, I'm not living down there. And she's like, coach, football coach, the AD. Yeah, I'm not living there. Yeah. She's like, why? Wow, it's, it's right there. And I'm like, no, that's an hour a day. Yeah. Oh, no, it's it's 22 minutes. And I'm like, no, it's it's 22 minutes if nothing goes wrong. Sure. Something's going to go wrong every day. I can't commit an hour. You think you understand my job. You don't. But I don't have an hour a day. Right. Whether I'm trying to be good at my job or not, I don't want to be in a car an hour a day. That's going to prevent... Three days a week, my wife stopping by. Yeah. It's going to prevent two times a week that she brings the kids by. Yeah. For 20 minutes. No, I'm not doing it. Well, it's it, it's funny, too, because like people when people think of the commute, they don't go, okay, this is going to cost an hour a day. It's going to cost two hours a day of work. It never eats into the work time. Yes. It's, it's the leaving early from home, the people you say that you're doing this all for that are most important. That's who we put on the chopping block first. That's exactly right. We're, 
we're eliminating Tom from them. Yeah. We're not eliminating Tom from work. Yes. And I think that obviously I've evolved or tried to evolve in a positive way. I, I actually, on this topic, I mentioned to our strength coach yesterday when I was training, I said, I don't know if I'll ever take another job, but if I take another job, I'm walking to work. Oh. And if I can't walk to work, I'm not taking the job. And uh, obviously I'm older than him. And he said, coach, you walk enough. And I go, no, it's the principle of I'm closer to being an empty nester than yeah. I am raising a family. Sure. And there's going to be an adjustment involved with that that I'm not aware of. So I want the caveat to be if I take another job, my wife can walk to work or I can walk home. Yeah. And I think that 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 decision would impact hundreds of decisions. Yeah. As opposed to the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. People people tend to think about opportunities in terms of like, hey, is this best for me? Does it move my career forward? Does it make me more money, et cetera? They don't often back out like, hey, what are my values? What's important to me? And what do I want my life to look like day to day? We have this, we'll do all this stuff that we don't like. So in the distant future, when we retire or when we make a certain amount of money or we have power or success, then we'll be able to do more. Of the, but but we don't really think about like, hey, what do I want my day-to-day -day life to look like? Which is what we had sort of optimized for here, living in a small town, living in Texas as opposed to New York or LA. The only the only way I'm justifying this thing to myself is like, one, like you do whatever you need to do for your kids. And then two, an hour of the commute, we're together, right? It's not like, hey, we live over here and I drive, you know, into Manhattan to work all day. It's I'm driving, I'm spending the time with them. There actually is something, and I've, I've heard from parents who have older kids, they're like, Actually, like when you're strapped in the car together, it it's some of the only quality time you get because mm -hmm. like you're forced to spend time together and stuff happens. But um, it's it's an adjustment period. I, I'm, I would very much optimize for routine and life and ease. And then, you know, life has other plans. How old are your boys now? The, 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 the one that we're doing the commute for is seven, turning eight. But it is what it is. Um, speaking of coaching, did I tell you I'm working on a book for Coach Rav? I talk to him every third day and for sure within that I'm either talking to him before your Friday morning yeah. talk or shortly thereafter. Um, you know how I feel about coach and you're extending his life. He's the best man. It's, it's unbelievable. I, I'm so thankful for, for the friend that you are to him. Um, I, I can't, I do not have the vocabulary that either of you guys do, but if I recorded only the portions where he talked about you, you, you have no idea oh. the impact you're having on his heart. He's, like, like no idea. Oh. He turns 87 years old tomorrow. Yeah. And if you talk to him, not you. Because I, I can ha I have a vibe for what's going on. But when I talk to him, specific to you, yeah. specific to the project, he's 47 years old. It's unbelievable. This dude's life is unreal. Yes. Like he is... First off, I was uh, speaking of driving, so I was thinking about this with him. So when he was born, the average life expectancy for a black man was like 47. And you know what happened when he was driving to work at USC when he was like 50 years old? He got in a car there. accident and very nearly died. And so he's really lived like several Double. lives, but he doubled, <laughs> he, he's effectively doubled it. Yeah. And, and, and the second half of his life may be more interesting than the first half. For sure. And the first half involved the I Have a Dream speech and Wilt Chamberlain and Harry Truman and breaking all these barriers. It's yes. unreal. Yeah, and, and I don't even... Uh, sometimes we talk about this. I'm like, Coach, you know, I, I know of you as a coach. Yeah. But I never met you until you weren't a coach. 
Mm. And I stalked him to meet him. Yeah. And then we've become what we've become. And I tell him all the time, I'm like, even on the documentary when all that started. Yeah. And I don't know what you know about it or don't know about it, but. I've read some of the interviews. Insane. Is that right? Yeah. You just have Phil Knight going like, there wouldn't be a Nike as it is today without this guy. And you're just like, and, and nobody knows who he is. I know. And, you know, we argued for three years about writing a book. Yeah. About doing something like this. Like, Coach, that's selfish. To not do it? Yeah, it's yeah. selfish. Yeah. That's wrong, man. Yeah. No. And he would he <laughs> he would get very offended. Huh. With me. Yeah. And he has talked to me, I don't in ways that I don't think he talks to most people. Yeah. And vice versa. Sure. Coach, that's wrong. Like, there are other Georges on earth now that don't know the George. Yeah. And you're doing them a disservice by not telling them the story of the original George. Right. Right. Not the color of their skin. Yeah. Not where they're from. Not that they can play, don't play, can coach, don't coach. No, no, no. You're negatively impacting them because you're not giving context to your life. Yeah. And that's selfish. That's really interesting. Oh, he would cuss me out. <laughs> He would cuss, and he doesn't cuss like that. He would Why did you me. seek him out? He would, what, tell oh, me that story. I stalked story. him. I, like, literally, I stalked him. And um, so he was speaking at an event. I found out he was speaking at the event. I called the guy that was running the event, and I said, is there any way that you could let me be the MC of the event? Not telling him why. <laughs> yeah. I ended up being the first speaker at the event. And, and like, what, where were you coaching Houston, at this point? I was an assistant at Colorado State. 13 hours later, Coach Rav is the keynote speaker. Yeah. I'm speaking at whatever, 9 o'clock in the morning. He's speaking at 7 o'clock at night. There's... 12 people there at nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I stay there the entire day to listen to him. He finishes speaking. I introduce myself and I said to him, Hey coach, uh, do you happen to know where you're staying? And he said, are you the kid that spoke earlier today? And I go, yes, sir. He goes, I'm going to have dinner. And I said, oh, okay, well, I'm not trying to bother you. I was just wondering where you were staying. Long story short, I go to dinner with him. I get in the car with him. My car is in the parking lot. Yeah. I get in the car with him, go to dinner. The driver carries him to the hotel. I carry his bags to check in. I'm carrying his bags to the elevator. I hand him his bags, and I go, Coach, I really appreciate dinner, and it's so nice to meet you. And he goes, where are you going? And I go, I'm not sure, coach. Don't worry about anything. Really appreciate your time. I stayed in the lobby of the hotel until he woke up the next morning to check out. And I was sitting right there. And I stood up. I go, good morning, coach. How you doing? And he just kind of whacked out. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Who are you? Yeah. Hey, coach, I just wanted to... Tell you one more time, I really appreciate your time. And he goes, did you stay here all night? I said, yes, sir. I stayed here all night right there. He goes, did you sleep? I said, no, sir. I just sat in that chair. He goes, where are you going? I said, well, I've got to figure out how to get back to my car. This is in 2001. Yeah. You're not getting in an Uber. Yeah. there. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> your car? <laughs> I go, yes, sir, my car is in the parking lot wherever we were speaking yesterday. Yeah, I just love him. Why do you think, why did you, I mean, there are a lot of coaches you could learn from. Why did you, why'd you pick that one and why were you so intense about him? Well, 
as you it's know, not like he's won a bazillion uh, championships or he's an average, under the radar guy. Yes. Um, he was not a coach at that time. And he had not at that time completely become to Nike what he had what he yeah. ended up becoming. Sure. Running EYBL and all the things that he did. Um just always like you. I, I'm attracted to anybody regardless of industry or age or race on uh someone maybe that I could learn from. Yeah. And um not that I had any inkling of an idea of what the relationship would become, but from from that meeting in the fall of twenty oh one, I mean he's one of the most important mentors in my entire life. Yeah. Not I don't even know that I've ever even talked to him about basketball, to be honest. Right. Like that's not our 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 relationship didn't begin that way. It was through basketball that we met, but how it has blossomed. He watches us. He keeps up with us. He knows what's going on, but we, we don't we don't have conversation about it. But you know what's interesting? You you guys are similar in that. I mean, he's a basketball coach. You're a basketball coach. But I, I don't think anyone thinks. George Raveling is the best X and O's guy. Right. And I don't think they necessarily think of you as an X and O's guy. No. But there is something about a certain kind of coach that you both are. And maybe you sensed in him, mm. like, this is a guy who does what I want to do in a way that I think I'm capable of doing. Or he is he's the master of a certain style or genre yeah. that is the, the one that's for me. He... Um... He made a life slash a career in multiple industry, so to say, on relationships. Yeah, I think th- um, I-, I think he's a connoisseur of leadership, and I think he has exquisite taste on how to develop, consistently grow relationships regardless of era yeah. uh, of type he just he's just so good to people and yeah. i think you know like obviously over the last couple of decades you know i would talk to people that work for him kids that played for him who are my age <laughs> and they never speak to the x's and o's yeah like that never is a broached in the conversation and I think that that speaks to how impactful the relationship was. That basketball brought us together, but that's not yeah. what kept us together, if that makes sense. Apparently when, when Ben Affleck went to Michael Jordan to ask him if he mm. could do that movie air, uh, Jordan said, yes, but I have two conditions. One, Viola Davis has to play my mother. Yep. And two, George Raveling has to be a main character in the movie. So you think about like you think about relationships. He's thinking, who's my mom, and I better give credit to this other guy too. Amazing! It's crazy. And then and then and I mean even uh, that's that's the payoff of the relationship of why Jordan ended up at Nike was George. Yes. You know, not the hard sell, but the hey, I just give him a shot. Yes. And so he's a relationship guy. And yeah, I mean, most of, like it was crazy to me walking through his life as I'm working on this thing. Like, I kept thinking there'd be like some really big players that he coached. And there's B.J. Armstrong, a few, but actually most of his impact was way later. It's yeah. Nowitzki and Yao Ming. It's at Nike where yeah. he wasn't actually coaching the players, right. but he was like, no, this is the guy, yeah. and he sensed something in people. So it's a developer of talent and relationship in in a context other than just on the court and i think that um one other thing that i've learned just from watching him mostly from listening to him and some from just um maybe processing what he's trying to teach me he has an innate feel for where it's going yeah, where a situation is going, where a sport is going, where a business is going, where a person is going, 
like he can project out hmm. and it's been interesting he doesn't uh he's never talked down to me but he's never talking to me about today ever everything is in the realm of buzz I, i've been thinking about this and i was wondering I wonder about this a decade from now. Yeah. And I'm like, Coach, I don't even know what to say. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, you don't have to know. Just think on this for down the line. And I think Yao Ming, all of those, if it's a player, if it's what basketball is going to become, if it's what he's going to become, he's just very futuristic in having a pulse on I need to be better prepared on this. And that's been so good to me. But that's one of the benefits of, of age, I think, is that you just have more time, right? So you, 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 have, thought, you have seen things unfold in a way that the young, younger people simply haven't. I remember you and I were talking, like, this would have been summer of 2020. So the pandemic, no. you were, you were, all the teams and the offseason had been disrupted. And I remember you were saying something to me about the players. You were like, I'm trying to talk to him about it. And I remember what I thought, and I, I explained it to you, but I was really explaining it to myself. I was like, okay, so they've not been able to play for like six months or whatever. And to you and I, six months is nothing. Six months is six months. But this is like 5% of their life. Yes. You know, it's like, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a statistically significant chunk of time to them. Yes. And so when you're, when you're in your 80s, like you've had bad decades, right? You know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. You you've had quarter centuries that were rough, right. right? Like you can say things like 50 years ago we did it differently, yes. And so you can you can then apply that to the future, yep. and obviously this is to me the only other way you can get this. And so so George is in his 80s. But he's also like a thousand years old because he's read so much That's history. Exactly right. When you've studied history, you can also get that. So like you go, hey, yeah, there have been decades. There's been periods when we had like four bad presidents in a row. <laughs> there's been decades, where, you know, you you ha- you go, hey, do you know how long it took him to cure polio? Yeah. You know, you 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 have a, a larger hist- You're expanding your historical viewpoint, That's right. or or whatever, and then that allows you kind of turns down the volume on yeah. on what's happening in front of you right now, which is seemingly urgent and massive, but it's not. It's just because it's in front of you at this yes. moment. And his perspective because of those things, how he articulates it, I think is what makes him so special. Yeah. He he can articulate it in the now. Yeah. Where you can comprehend it. But it also gives it for me, it gives my heart pause on uh, coach, let me write that down. Say it again. Yeah. I, I just want to write it down, not because it may apply today, but he's telling me today and it's giving me pause on, yeah, I need to have discernment on this for where it may go. Yeah. And I've, I've seen how notes that I have written that are his words and his ideas from whatever, 10 years ago that I'm like, yeah, coach told me that a long time ago. And I catch myself saying that to him over the last couple of years as our industry has changed, some of the things that he was telling me long before it ever became what it has become, Buzz, you ought to think about this. Yeah, he was. And, he was. He knew it was coming. Yeah, he he, and he's not stating this is the exact scenario. Yeah, but it's just the totality of his message. In, uh, you know, like he's he's constantly. You know, when I'm when I'm with him, you know, he's constantly writing. Yeah. And he's like, hey, now I'm going to show you this. Uh, don't write it down. I'm just going to give this to you. <laughs> and so he's writing it, so I'll listen, so I don't write. And then he just gives it to me. And then he'll tear it off and hand it to me, and he'll go, all right, now let's go over this. Well, I just heard him say it. Yeah, yeah. I just watched him write it. All right, now, Buzz, you're 51. All right, now let's look over here. Your sixth bucket of life starts in nine years. You're going to be 60 to 70. Now let's talk about that. How long will you and Corey have been married? How old is Sissy going to be? How old is Bubba going to be? And he just starts 
we're, we're not talking about now. Yeah. We're just thinking about this six bucket of life over here. And it's amazing, like, when I talk to him how, hey, Coach, you remember when you said this two years ago when I flew out there to see you? No. All right, well, let me let me, let me me give it to you again. Yeah. And then it kind of triggers him to go, yeah, I remember. All right, well, just just riff off of it. Just I'm going to be quiet, and I'm just going to start taking notes on my phone. And he'll just start talking. You know, and I'm like, oh, man, this is – what a blessing yeah. to have someone that has that information, has that wisdom, has that discernment, whatever the word is, but that he's willing to share. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been writing about this recently. It's something I've been thinking about, like that one of, the, one of the hallmarks of wisdom is the ability to understand downstream consequences. Yes. So it's like, if I do this, this will happen way down here. So if I make this shift, if I start talking mm. like this, if I... It, if if they do this if like so you're 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 able to predict the future because you have so much understanding of the past you've moved yes. these things around enough times that you know how different things are connected and i find that people who are not very good at what they do are sort of always being surprised by that cause and effect and people who have been around a long time they go hey this is what this is going to mean down the line so uh I don't think it's ironic that you would say that. So uh, this morning on my walk, um, kind of do certain things when I'm on my walks. And a portion of the time, I don't want to do anything. Yeah. I just kind of want to look and think. and. But when I think of something, I just type it in my phone. I think as a leader, our job is to anticipate the problem and have a plan. But so much of what I'm seeing in leadership now, they're not only not anticipating the problem or having any level of plan, they're just reacting to the problem. Yeah, sure. And so then from that chair of leadership, you're just constantly in a reactionary state. Yeah. And I'm I'm convicted in whatever level of leadership that I have, even just as a husband and as a father, I need to think about and be more aware and anticipatory of what could happen. Yeah. Just so that if it does Hey, what about this? Yeah. And I see so much of leadership. It's just completely reactive. And I'm like, yeah, there's there's seven things here, and you're so bent on this one, and the narrative you want to create is on this one. And uh, we'll worry about the six later. And I'm like, it's just going to stay in a constant churn yeah. of deceival. Yeah, Robert Greene calls this tactical hell, right? So the difference uh. between strategy and tactics is tactics is like all this little piddly shit. It's reactive. And then a strategist is like, I'm going to do this and they're going to do that. And then I'm going to do this. And it's all uh. working towards something, right? Uh. And we're, we, most people are tactical. They're day to day. They're waking up and they're like, what do I have right now? What did someone email me right now? What What happened on social media while I was sleeping as opposed to, they knew what their job was yeah. weeks ago for yes. today. Like, yes. Um, yes. like great coaches, I think yes. they're yes. they're fluid and reactive, but they're also like they're doing what they're doing. It almost doesn't matter what the other team is doing because they're on their track. And uh, to that point, this is good talk. I like tactical hell. Um, I f I feel the older I get, maybe it's because I'm getting older. Uh, maybe it's because I've been doing it a while. Maybe it's because I've re-engineered what I think is important. Yeah. And so I I look at a figurative box score of my life in a different way on what I think is important. But the other thing is, is distraction. Some people view social media as a distraction. Um, whatever you view distraction to be. Yeah. To me, that's the greatest tactic or the best tactic of failure. 
Because if you're constantly in a state of distraction, yeah. to me, you have no chance. You're going to fail. Yeah. And I'm seeing that I get a year older, but in essence, the people that I'm around every day are the same age and have <laughs> been for 30 years. Yeah. That's and weird. I, um, I told one of our new players when we started summer school a month ago, he came in the gym for a skill workout. He doesn't know me, really, and I don't really know him. And he brought his phone in the gym. I'm in the weight room. I'm looking out the window. I watch his skill workout. He comes in to say good morning. And I go, hey, I want to try something with you. And it'll be good for you and I to build trust. But it's kind of like an experiment. And he's like, okay, coach. I said, I don't want you to ever bring your phone in the gym again. And he goes, oh, no, coach, I was just – I go, no, no, no. I'm not upset at all. Yeah. This is just me and you. I'm not going to take my phone in there ever again, and you're not going to take your phone in there ever again. As long as you're on this team and as long as I'm on this team, that's just me and you. Yeah. I've never said this to any player. Yeah. I'm not mad. 30 days ago, I see him yesterday, comes in to say good morning after his skill workout, and I go, hey, man, where's your phone? He goes, Coach, I promise it's in the locker room. And I go, thanks for trusting me. Yeah. Do you think you're doing better when you're out there? And he goes, I don't know, maybe. I said, you are. Maybe the results aren't better, but there's a period of no distraction that all you're doing is that. Sure. Whether it's good or bad, you're not setting your phone down to go to work. And as soon as your, quote, work is over, you're going immediately back to your phone to see what you missed. I know as soon as you get in the locker room, you're going to do it. But that it's a distraction-free zone relative to that device, I think it might help you. But also, I bet, like one of the interesting things probably for you, you're getting older. The kids are staying the same age. You've seen every person's different and unique. But at the same time, you've seen every type of person there <laughs> I've is. I've seen right? a lot of them. And so, so there's probably something also where you're like, you came up with an idea. You suggested it to a player. The idea wasn't important. What's important is is that after 30 days, he or she either shows you that they're the yes. person who did the thing or not did the thing. For sure. And you can probably tell from that singular instance whether they're going to succeed or fail because yes. you know that you know that tells you, you again the downstream consequences. If if you, someone makes a commitment and they follow through, that tends to mean X. If someone makes a commitment, does it for a little bit, doesn't follow through, then lies about it, that means something else. Yes. And you've just seen that a lot of times. And I think one of the benefits of mentors and coaches or whatever is like they've seen you before at this place. They've seen all the yeah. types of person and they can tell you what to, to do or not do. And you decide who you are by choosing to do it or not. <laughs> So I told him at the end yesterday morning, I said, you're doing better, whether the results would say that or not. He said, you really think so? And I said, uh, I know so. And I said, this will come across arrogant, but I don't mean it arrogant. I'm, I'm the guy subbing you in and out. Yeah. And so even if the results are the same, I trust you more because you've done exactly what I've asking you to do. Yeah. And so I know if I'm not here tomorrow and you do skill, you're not bringing your phone in here. Yeah. So it creates a level of trust. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, coach, I guess I didn't think about that. <laughs> and I said, yeah, you're thinking about playing time. So yeah. I understand. I said, but here's what I'm saying. Someday you're going to be my age and you can't play. And I'm wondering if you can learn the discipline at your age of how you can limit your exposure to distractions. How can you limit your exposure to temptations? Because even at my age, uh, I'm not tempted by the phone the way you are. Yeah. Cause I don't know how to operate the phone the way you do. It's not as part of much a part of your daily functioning. I said, but I said, I still have problems with temptation, sure. not to cheat on my wife, but I, the, the temptation for me is a distraction. And the distraction could be a lot of different things. So I'm constantly 
trying to figure out a way, how can I limit my exposure to any of that? Yeah. And me watching you every morning when you come in here, I've already been in the weight room. Yeah. So I watch you arrive and I watch you leave because I'm still training. Yeah. But that you're doing what I ask has created a level of trust because I told you something to do or ask you to do something one time. Yeah. And so now I know I should never bring my phone in there because I ask you to do it and you've done exactly that. And I respect that. Well, I have a story in the, in the justice book that I was going to put in the discipline book because I think it's interesting how interrelated mm. these things are. So I, I have a story in the, in the justice book that on one level seems like a discipline book, but it's a, a discipline idea, but it's actually a justice thing. It's about this poet. Her name is Danielle De Prima. She's, uh, she's at this famous party with all these famous writers, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg. It's like a cool literary party. And she gets up to leave. Like, it's like nine o'clock. She gets up to leave and they go, where are you going? Like, you arrived, you know? <laughs> uh, and she goes, I got to go relieve my babysitter. I told the babysitter I'd be home by nine. Mm. And um, they go, babysitter? They go, if you want to make it as a writer, you got to forget about the babysitter. Like, this is the thing. And she says, I gave the babysitter my word. And, and she would say later that what she knew in that moment was that keeping her word to the, if she didn't keep her word to the babysitter, she wouldn't keep her word to herself mm -hmm. about the commitments to write and do the work. She said, it's the same commitment. Like, I'll be home by nine uh, to, to, to put my kid to bed is the same commitment as I will arrive at nine to yes. write tomorrow morning. Yes. And if you get in a thing with yourself or with other people where you don't do what you say, it's very hard to be successful. That's discipline. It's also very hard to be a good person. That's justice. And, and so it's this, like you build these habits where I do what I say. He said, I'm not gonna bring my phone in the gym. He doesn't bring his phone in the gym. That says more than the yes. workout. That says Period. more than, than, than the distraction. At the same time, it also says something about those things too. Do you know what I mean? It yeah. says something about you as a person, but you're also demonstrating it over and over again. Like, hey, I do what I say, and also I'm building this habit, this muscle of doing the thing. I think um, I think I may have heard um, your podcast with Cal Newport when you mentioned the justice versus discipline conversation, and I actually paused the podcast um, I was driving. Yeah. I remember it now. And I left myself a voicemail because I was like, I don't know if I understand the difference. Not that I disagree yeah. with what you said in the podcast or what you just said now, but I'm like, I wonder if I were to teach a first grader, this is what discipline means and this is what justice means. How would I explain the contrast? So yesterday we're starting camp and I always, I start camp because I feel like it's my camp. Yeah. And uh, there's only three words on our wall in the facility and you've seen it, love, work, and trust. And so um, last week there were second through sixth graders at the camp. This week it's seventh through 12th graders, completely different environment in the gym. But also, um, I'm explaining yesterday as I'm starting camp, everybody has a different definition of love. Sure. And work and trust. So before we start camp, let me just tell you what those words are in our program. And that does not mean that we're right. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that what you would describe your words, uh, what your definition is to be wrong. And I was thinking about this when I walked away. One of the camp coaches who I didn't know was introducing himself. And he goes, Coach, that was really good. And I was like, what? W what was really good? He goes, what you just said. I go, thank you. What, though? Yeah. What was good? Because it, similar to what you're saying, what, it, what is discipline to Ryan versus what is discipline to the young man who I don't know, who I'm saying – don't bring the phone to the gym. Sure. It, it can be different things. Yeah. And so one of the things with our group that I've, um, I'm trying to f sort through how to be more uh, succinct in my words with them. What, 
there's so much that it feels like we can't control. Yeah. What is it that we can control? Well, we can control our words. Yeah. We can control our work. I think we can control our discipline. Yeah. I think we can control our reactions. I think we can control our attitude. Instead of talking about the things or giving emotion or energy to the things that we can't control. Let's just leave that alone and put it under the invisible mirror. Is this something we can control or is this something we can't control? Yeah. Oh, we can't control this buzz. Okay, well, how should we control it? And within the framework, we're completing, uh, completely not giving energy to the things that we can't control, but of what we can control. And I'm trying to improve in that regard. Sure. Like, what can I control? And um, time has been on... Time's been something I've been paying attention to more of, uh, similar to some of the things we were talking about with Coach Rav, and it's how am I spending my time? Um, It's arguably the greatest resource any of us have, but we can't create more. We know that. We can just waste less. Yeah, but we also don't even know how much time we have left. Sure. And so then how... How important, how more important is it of the things we can control, including our time, within how we utilize our time? Yeah. Well, and me, to me, that's discipline. Of course. Okay. No, and, and look, the, the virtues are are inseparable from each other, right? Okay. And as soon as you try to make very clear distinctions, yeah. I think you get yourself in trouble, right? Because Fair enough. if courage yeah. is doing the thing you're afraid of, yep. right? But what if you're doing the wrong thing and that's why you're afraid of it? Like what if you're what if you're fighting for a bad cause? Yep. Right? Or what if you're you're disciplined, like you're hardworking, you're committed, you're you're not stopping, but you're misinformed. And so you're doing the wrong thing. You're doing something that doesn't make a difference. Yep. So so the 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 virtues are are all related and impossible to separate. And that yep. and, and I think what you tend to find is that they they're they're Distinct, but also the same. So, so this story about this woman keeping her word, she realizes, hey, like I gave the, my, my babysitter the word, uh, my word, so I have to keep it because it's the right thing to do. Yes. It's also the disciplined thing to do because if you get in the habit of not doing what you say, well, now you're a person who doesn't do what they say. Yes. And if you say, hey, I'm going to run a marathon, well, now you've you got a million reasons to listen to the excuses that let you off the hook from doing this thing you committed to do. So the, the discipline of, hey, I told you I would be there uh, at volunteer for your cause, and now I don't feel like showing up, that's a, not the right thing to do, that you're screwing someone over. If you say, hey, I'm gonna get up early and hit golf balls in the morning before my game to practice, you're gonna screw yourself over if you're the person who says, well, nah, it's early, I don't want to anymore. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so the, it's, it's the same, it, you're getting from either virtue, you're getting to the same place, which is you made a commitment, are you doing it or not? Yes. So they're all, they're all related. But think of this idea, okay, this idea of like, we focus on what we control. I think that must be interesting as a coach because you have, a, you have what seems like a lot of control, right? Coaches are powerful, they're important. They can do this, run these laps. You, you have a lot of discretion. And yet I've got to imagine the longer you do it, you, the longer you do it, either as a coach, you become egotistical and convinced you're yes. the puppet master who can make anything happen. You become a tyrant or you're the kind of coach who in, in, a, in almost more of a Zen-like way become aware of how little control you have over things and the tension between that that must be an interesting balance. I think early, this is, uh, I just finished my 30th season in coaching. 17 now I've been a head coach. And I would say before I knew you or before I'd read any of your work, I would say I was on the way to egotistical, power-hungry, driven for the wrong reasons probably at uh, a normal rate maybe slightly faster and I think now that I'm wherever I'm at in my career 
I'm completely against that way. Huh. And much more aware of the constant tension in every possible way and how little control I do have. And I've sp- that has changed how I have spent my time um, as a leader, but it's also changed how I do many things within our program, whether it's with my staff, um, whether it's with our team, uh, who I hire, who we recruit, because I think the greatest impact I can have is on the hearts and the minds and the souls of the people involved, regardless of their title, regardless of their age, uh, regardless of where they came from. I feel like that is more my calling, so to say. Uh, I'm not saying that courage is my calling, but I feel like that's more my purpose than what's my favorite sideline out of bounds play to score uh, with two seconds left. So I'm not go- saying I don't care about the sideline out of bounds play, but I think early in my career, if I to be vulnerable, I think I was wanting to have the right sideline out of bounds play so that the narrative would be what a great coach Buzz is. And so we would spend – an inordinate amount of time in preparation if by chance, which it's a low percentage chance, that that occurrence would happen, that we would be prepared. And now I'm almost probably to the other extreme. And we we probably need to have a sideline out of bounds play to score, guys. Um, If we need one, I'm going to call a timeout. That (laughs) might be one thing. And here's the other thing. If you guys don't mind, uh, we're going to give some time to specials, a special situation on these days. And I've just created within the routine of what we do that everybody's aware we're going to work on that sideline out of bounds play or whatever. But it's because my, uh, my heart has changed on what I believe the most important impact should be. It it sounds like, and I can relate to this, you're a little less outcome focused mm-hmm. and more process and people focused. Like I found this like, mm-hmm. I, I would say early on, I was like, how many copies is this gonna sell? How is this gonna do? What am I gonna get? Mm-hmm. As opposed to like, what are the things that I need to do? How can I get lost in actually doing it yep. and be present for it? And the the paradoxical thing was, it has for the most part translated into better outcomes. I just spend less time thinking about and aiming at very specific outcomes because that part's not in my control. Like I, I heard this story about John Wooden, uh, that he, you know, he practices the team very intensely throughout the week. And then right before they would go on, like run out of the tunnel, he would say, well, guys, I've done my job. And there's something about the, like, handing it to them yeah now obviously when you would watch sideline footage he's clearly coaching he's not just like sitting there but he's basically saying the bulk of my contribution was last week and 10 years ago leading up to this moment i'm not going to grip everything so tightly in the minute it's happening to get it to go a very specific way because that's actually much less in my power than i would like it like to think it is so I've read, I think this is your 12th book. I've read the other 11 and I've bought uh, 2,000 copies of the other 11 to Thank give you. them away. And you know what? I've learned a lot from you on the work is the win. And uh, not to take it away from what you do for a living or even make it about what I do, but it's almost regardless of industry, we live in such an we live in a world of expectations. Sure. And then we're constantly trying to meet those expectations as if when we meet them, okay, we made it. And then we realize, no, let's, it's got to go to they the next one. They just move the expectations. Yeah, let's yeah. just keep changing the goalpost. And so I think what I have sensed trying to be ultra self aware over the last, I don't know, five, 10 years, and I see it even evolving in that time frame is 
Well, we live in a world of expectations. Sure. And so I've just kind of quit paying attention to those expectations. I'm not saying that they're not a part or they should go away or I, I get all of it. But if we live in an expectation world, I've just let that go and tried to be consumed with today regardless of the result of today because whether we win this game or lose this game if I'm going about the process or the work the right way I don't think it should alter or affect what I'm going to do tomorrow right yeah. if I'm going about this the right way what I'm doing today the intent and the purpose and more maybe the why so are you saying that the result of today should change what I'm doing tomorrow? No, it should. It may alter it if it makes the process better the next day, but that's the only reason why. Yeah, it's like, look, if somebody strike, if a professional baseball player strikes out at one at bat, I mean, they know they're getting multiple at bats in that game. Right. So they, they, unless they did something extremely wrong, right, uh, or they learned something dramatic about the the pitcher in front of them. The best thing for them to do is to act as if it never happened, whether they hit a home run or yeah. they struck out, right? Is to is to go up and do your thing exactly the same way the next time. And and the the problem is we don't we don't we see the thing in front of us as this looming enormous thing as opposed to one of many reps of that thing, you know? And look, if you don't win any games, they're not going to let you coach anymore. If I don't sell any books, they're not like it right. obviously matters to a degree. It's just right. you kind of realize the more you're focusing on these very very specific in- outcomes, it's actually taking you away from putting more resources at doing the thing. It's making you worse at the thing. That's interesting. I'm listening to what you're saying. Um, well, there's a, there's a hundred over a hundred years of experience on my staff with me. Yeah, you know most of those guys, and they've been with us, some of them from the very beginning. No matter where they joined the the tour at, and um, during this past season, on an off day, following a win. One of them, who's been with me over a decade, he was like, hey, coach, you, it's kind of different than what you once were. And I was like, well, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, surely I'm sure. a little better. Yeah, yeah. Is that what you're saying? He goes, no, just like you don't really like get hyped up and you don't like just snap completely. He goes, you get excited. I'm not saying that. And you don't get – upset i'm not saying that but it's just it's kind of more level even kill yeah and i go yeah i don't know if that's good or bad hmm. i said but it's good internally for me yeah i said just because i think i have a more direct path on what i'm supposed to do yeah and i'm more comfortable in how we're doing it and i think some of the emotions whether they were good or bad in an immature way were because of the result yeah of what had just transpired right. and i I'm, I'm trying to improve on not ever using the word win yeah and never using the word lose with our team and i don't want to be nick saban and say it's the process i i'm, I'm not trying to uh, still a mantra, but I have to be careful in a world of expectations with a group of 20 year old men who are living in a different world than I live in, whose historical perspective is very narrow and this is their chance. And I want to give them their best chance. So I want to make sure that what I'm providing for them gives them their best chance not specifically to on the floor, but in all categories of their life. And if they're on a roller coaster because they're seeing me on a roller coaster, well, I don't think in a world of expectations that what that gives them the most stability. And it's almost like I, I, I feel like some of the instability that comes from all of these expectations 
that's not really who you're competing against anyway. I think the the leverage should be from the instability. Well, what is the leverage? Well, the leverage should be the stability yeah. if you have a path on the purpose and the how and the why to the instability that comes from all the expectations. Well, it's like probably a 19-year-old who's trying to make the NBA or – get out of where they're coming from through the game of basketball, yeah. this thing they've been good at their whole life that they're deeply passionate about and love, they probably don't... The lesson they need from their coach is probably not that winning is really, really important and losing really, really sucks. They know that. I know. What they need from you is the ability to bounce back from both of those, right? The ability to be like... Uh, there's this great passage from Mark Struis. He says, to accept it without arrogance and to let it go with indifference. Mm. That's what you're teaching, right? You're going, hey, we won. That doesn't say anything about us. We lost. That doesn't say anything about us. We got to go do the thing tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And and yeah, winning shouldn't knock us off our block and losing shouldn't knock us off our block. No. The only thing that we should be concerned about is if we think we didn't do what we were trying to do, right? Like I got it's like did I think the book was good? Did I do my best? <laughs> right. Did I put everything into it? Great. Some random reviewer it you know, I I got a real shitty review on this book from someone. That guy who I don't know, who I didn't care about 8 seconds ago, I never even heard of. Yes. Him saying that I didn't do this thing I wasn't even trying to do to begin with, that doesn't determine whether it's good or not. And and if I overcorrect, I now, on the next project, which is what I'm on to, that guy's voice is in my head, I'm not going to do as good a job because I'm going to be trying to please this one person right. as opposed to following the process and values and ideas that I should be focused on. But I think you've done an extraordinary job of not, allowing the 99 positive comments versus the one negative comment. I, I think you handle the criticism and the praise the same. Yeah, sure, and you so, have to. Uh, I think how how you go about that is the secret sauce. Yes. And, and I don't know that I'm mature enough to go, all right, well, let me see all 100 <laughs> and let me just read them just yeah. so that I can be happy about the 99. Yeah. And then be upset about the one. And so I don't know if this is the right thing. So I've just tried to stay away from all 100. Yeah. But I don't exactly, I haven't completely figured out how to do that, to yeah. be transparent. No, no, look, it would be amazing if someone was so secure, so self-aware, so rational that they could take yeah, all the rational. feedback <laughs> and, and just deal with it like it didn't matter and it didn't have impact. Like that you and this I look the the highest level of stoicism is yeah you could have someone spit in your face and then someone tell you that the best and not have either of those things register with you, but I think that's extremely hard yeah. and extremely unlikely and so yeah creating a bit of a bubble a protective space around you is really critical. Uh, it can't be absolute because then you can start to live in some fake reality. Yeah. But at the same time, the more you insulate, there's a letter from Hemingway to Fitzgerald or Fitzgerald to Hemingway, I forget it, but he basically says, look, if you read the good reviews and you let them matter to you, you got to read the bad reviews and they're going to matter to you. Yes. And it's better to just be like, look, does it matter? Did it, did it do what I was trying to do? And do the people I care about that I'm close to yes, that's, that, that love me regardless, right. are they like, you did it, you didn't do it? That That's the only kind of feedback you want to let into the into the inner sanctum. And I've got to get better at that because I, I think the, there's um, it's directly proportional, in my opinion. I think it's directly proportional that my growth is based on the willingness to accept the truth. So even if the one negative is the truth, my growth is based on can I accept that yeah. without running away per se and saying 99 said this was great this guy over here said it's bad yeah yeah but i think my growth over the rest of my life is 
can I receive the truth? Am I filtering the truth through the right filters to receive it and go, whatever the truth is, good or bad, I'm not going to run away from it. Sure. And I think that that's where I've, where I have to continue to figure out how to improve because of the exposure, like what you're doing, you're, you're everywhere. And so, okay, well, there's going to be 99 good things and one bad thing. Yeah. So how are you filtering? Are you paying attention to all 100 or just like, no, I don't even look at it, Buzz. I'm paying somebody else to look at it. Uh, Cause I'm just going to keep going on what I have planned. And I think that's that's where I have to improve because I want to receive the truth and I don't want to run away. But I think that the truth, as long as it's filtered appropriately, is directly proportional to my growth. But I also think you have such a, a powerful role in, in modeling and teaching this to like. So look, you're a grown ass man. You have a sense of who you are. You have 30 years of accomplishments. You have other things outside the 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 game that that can balance you and fulfill you right mm -hmm. i got to imagine it is so destabilizing and dangerous to be 20 years old and have tens of thousands of people cheering yes. for you millions of people following you on social media that means hundreds of thousands of people not liking you on social media yes. And so, so to be able to, to sort of maintain, the Stokes would call this having an inner citadel, like just a, a sense of your core worth and strength, what's in your control, you know, your agency as a person that's, that, that's indifferent to all these things that are happening outside. Hmm. This, that's something you accumulate over experience and time. Most of us are not thrust into the, the yeah. literal ar arena where people are going like this or like yeah. this to you. That would just be insane as a as a kid. I try to give them a lot of grace. Yeah. Because I think everything you said is exactly what it is. I feel very lucky that my book slowly succeeded because if I had gotten everything I thought I wanted, which is what I have now, on my first book, it would have destroyed me. I, I think so. Yeah. And I, I've tried to uh, find unique ways to connect with each of our guys because if they're at our level they are that whether they're doing it in real time at that particular day but and i just i try to ask them more questions than make statements on yeah so how do you feel about that like how do you think about that like teach it to me yeah and they're like well, you're the coach. And I'm like, I, I know, but I'm, I'm 51. Yeah, yeah. Like not being uh, a jerk to you. Like I already made it. Yeah. You, you're trying to make it and I'm watching what you're going through and how can I support you? How can I give you help? How can I show you grace? Cause I'm watching it happen. And I'm like, I'm offended. Like, Hey, shut up. Yeah, yeah he's a Leave kid. the what kid you... alone. Yeah, yeah. Not to negate the passion towards your team, but like their kids. I know his mom. Yeah. I know where his mom lives. Yeah. Like he's doing great. Yeah. Yeah. Like he's he's an overcomer. He's an overachiever that he's here. Yeah. Like if I showed you, you'd be like, good job. <laughs> yeah. Miss yeah. every shot. Yeah, yeah. And I've tried to and I think I've seen it more clearly as now some of my children are the age of our players. Yeah. And see, like 15 years ago, when I've got little kids, I didn't see it like that. Sure. And it wasn't the exposure that it is now. But I've learned a lot from our guys on, hey, thanks for teaching me that. Yeah. That's a powerful lesson. And I'm going to do better, and I'm going to figure out a way to help you. Yeah. And the next version of you oh and the my version goodness. after you. It's real. Yeah. It's real. Yeah, that's crazy. It's real. So what is it? Because you have this awesome video about what's an everyday guy? Yeah. Just are you are you tough enough to be an everyday guy? I think I – think I don't think it has anything to do with Paul. I think a lot of it has to do with how I was raised and what I witnessed as I was growing up is whatever it is that you're trying to do, what, however you deem success, 
are you tough enough to do that every single day? And yeah. I think that time, if, if you're basing it on talent, well, talent uh, at some point in time probably will prevail, but not always. And so if you remove talent, then it becomes consistency. Then it becomes discipline. Then it becomes how are you spending your time and are you tough enough to do those things every day? And like I tell our guys all the time, guys, uh, I would like to win. Uh, but but I, I want to win playing my hand. And I'm okay losing if I'm not playing my hand. Huh. And my hand is what I believe is right. And I can't sacrifice what I believe those things to be are right. And I'm not saying that I am right. I'm just saying uh, an everyday person is who I respect the most. An everyday person, their talent is going to improve because they're tough enough to do it every day. Hey, I can't shoot. Well, it's like compound interest. Just just shoot then if you can't shoot. Hey, I want to get stronger. Well, go in there and lift weights. Hey, I want to lose some weight. And I just think maybe it's counterintuitive to constantly talk about the end. Hey, you want to lose some weight? I can tell you how to lose weight. Don't eat breakfast for 200 days and walk on the treadmill. Do that for 200 days and then get on the scale. Not going the other way around. Sure. And I think that's, to me, that's what an everyday guy is. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's the difference between, my, my friend Austin Kleon talks about, he says, uh, you know, a lot of people want to be the noun, they don't want to do the verb, you know? <laughs> That's good. And, and I think, That's really good. I think it's, it's <laughs> like, we want these end states, we want to be seen as X, yeah. but we don't understand that it's really a result of doing Y, right? Like, 1, people, people want to publish books, they don't want to write books, yeah. but writing is a or, uh, publishing is a byproduct of writing. Of the writing, and and yeah, improving is a is a byproduct of doing the work. Having a great jump shot is the result of having done many many jump shots. So so much of what you're being praised for publicly is whatever it is that you're doing privately. Yes, yes. Uh, whether it's somebody making a jumper or somebody writing another another bestseller. Well, Ron, how are you doing that? There's layers to that. Yeah. But somewhere in that layer of what you've done over the last 15 years, somewhere in that layer, you've continued to refine the process. And somewhere in that process is included, I'm going to do it every day. Now, I may write more on Wednesday than I do on Saturday when I'm taking the kids to get donuts. But somewhere in there... The consistency of I'm going to do it every single day um, for me, where I'm from, how I grew up. That's what I respect. Yeah. Is the, is the toughness to do it every day. The success is a lagging indicator of the things you were doing. It's a quote shirt. I yeah. sent it to you. Yeah, yeah. All success is a lagging indicator. And so it, that, that's the point on uh, the biggest loser or the best jump shooter or the best author. Yeah, you're... If you're asking me about this, no question is a bad question, but that's the wrong question. Yeah. And I, 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 to what you said, like, I, I don't want you to talk about my Twitter feed. I don't want you to talk about my Instagram reel. I understand how I got a million followers. I understand how I have an email list of one million people. What you don't understand is where it started and how it got to that. And if we're only talking about right now, well, then you're never going to get it. I saw this thing with Chris Rock. He, he was talking more about inspiration, but I think it's true here. He was saying uh, a comedian makes the money during the day, but they collect it at night. Mm. So it's going around thinking about the things, working on the things, riffing about it with other comedians. That's where it's made. But then you, it's when you go up on stage for eight minutes or an hour... You know, whether you're in a club or you're selling out a theater, that's that's the the lagging indicator coming true. That's but good. the but the work, the important part was earlier that day or probably earlier that decade. So good. Yeah. You're collect it's so publishing good. is collecting, you know? Yes. Um 
but writing is 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 where the money's made or or the gym is where the money's made it's doing the thing that's the important part the public facing part is this accidental byproduct of doing the thing and i think uh too oftentimes it would be like me understanding what you do i don't i enjoy and i learn from and i grow from the what you do but the interaction the association the tour all of the things that come with writing that book that's a very small percentage of the actual work yeah for sure and that's one thing that uh as my career has unfolded the percentage of time that goes to what comes from this versus what it took to make this yeah diametrically opposed and it's very easy whether it's money whether it's ego whether it's power whether it's followings you have to be really careful that on that 180 you don't go all the way over there yeah and tip the scales upside down and i think that's why an everyday guy over time it's not the first one it's not the second one can he do it again can you do it again and if you can it is based somewhat on talent but it means you have kept in proportion what's required to do the actual work yes yeah an everyday guy is in the gym early whether it was a blowout loss the night before or whether you won a championship the day before they're in the gym whether it's been a good season a bad season whether they're feeling great whether they're not feeling great they're just they're doing they're doing the thing because i think um when you write your third bestseller human nature takes you to uh well ron you can go speak across the country to fortune 500 companies and arguably give less time less mental energy and make more money than when you write the next book oh that you just you just totally described the business that i'm in most non-fiction authors make more money from speaking than uh writing and it's much easier i mean look it's not it's hard yes. to get up on stage it's hard to command an audience but like it is it kicks your ass less, Way less. intellectually and creatively to just talk about a thing you've already done than to do the next thing and so the temptation is hey yeah i just want to go collect right i want to collect the rewards from the thing like like 90 percent of the talks i give are still about the obstacle is away a book i wrote 10 years ago so i could just wake up every day and just collect yes. dividends from a thing i already did yes but to me, waking up and doing the next thing is one more intellectually challenging and fulfilling, it, but it's also harder, and so it keeps me it keeps me honest. Yes, I think. Uh, but yeah, the, you can. I I empathize and understand why you don't want to do it. There's a there's an expression that a writer is someone to whom writing does not come easily. So, but speaking is easy in, in comparatively, and so yeah, you can just keep doing you can go towards the easier thing or you can go towards the harder thing and i think it's human nature to go towards the easier thing we're like water whether that's the success that came from the obstacle is the way book yeah versus it's time to write the next one and <clears throat> i think that um how you handle that equilibrium of easy and hard is what constitutes your sustainability but at some deeper level it's why are you doing it yeah. are you doing it so you can make a million dollars speaking in 2025 on the obstacle is the way well to your point you could have done that in 2018 when it had <laughs> been on the new york times bestseller for sure 92 weeks like just just run around but then you wouldn't have the relationship you have with your wife or uh, walking, running, swimming with your boys 
Like sure. it, it wouldn't have turned into this. And yeah. like, that's why I respect you and anyone like you that you're, you have constantly fought human nature. <laughs> now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to work. What are you going to do tomorrow? I'm going to work. Oh, I thought you were going to speak. No, I told him to stop. Hmm. I'm uh, Mark Batterson, who I think is a brilliant author who has <clears throat> started, started a church. Uh, he's about your age. And what he has done in his world is phenomenal. Yeah. Author, I think he's written 14 New York Times bestsellers. Wow. Uh, kind of got to know him the same way. And um, I have watched his career unfold from afar. We're not best friends. I'm not <laughs> suggesting that. But I've watched how he has stayed true to his mission. Sure. Uh, Bob Goff, another author, you know Bob Goff, lawyer, has created academies and helped thousands of orphaned orphans outside of the States. And his rule is, I'll speak, but I have to be home before dinner. Yeah. And it's kind of like Kid Rock. You know when Kid Rock um, got uh, maybe addicted to the wrong things? Uh, one of his rules was, uh, I'll go sing at the concert, but I have to be at home by midnight. Huh. And so based on where the concert was, was based on the type of jet he had. <laughs> And based on where the FBO was relative to the concert venue. Yeah. And based on uh, the car service on who they picked up. And like when he would finish the, uh, whatever it's called, yeah. the mic drop, when yeah. he was done, they said that as soon as he walked off the stage, that the door was already open and the driver already had started the car and he just got in. And they said that when he got to the tarmac, that when he pulled up to the FBO, the gate was already open. The driver never stopped, took him right to the gate. And they said that as soon as he got up the last step of the plane, they were already shutting it and the plane had already started and he was in the air. And they said that when he landed, it was the exact same. And that he quit asking, um, you know, there was a period of time, I guess, when he was really uh, popular. I don't really, I, I've just studied this scenario. Yeah. Um, they said that he would do the exact same thing when he landed in Detroit. Just to get from. home. Just to get home. Wow. And that he turned down that, you know how like um, uh, on some of those shirts that you wear on the back, it may have had the concert tour date. Sure. <laughs> they said that uh, you could, when you would uh, buy those shirts, if you really looked at the cities, it would be a certain portion of the United States, but it was all based on he had to be home by midnight, but nobody ever knew that. Wow. Yeah. I was That's... like, oh, <laughs> I like that guy. I like that too. 